Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's live broadcast, Comprehensive Anti-Doping Detection Using the Q-Exactive Orbitrap MS for Equine Urine Analysis. I am Judy O'Rourke of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots and sponsored by Thermo Fisher Scientific. Thermo Fisher Scientific Incorporated is the world leader in serving science with 50,000 employees in 50 countries. Their mission is to enable customers to make the world healthier, cleaner, and safer. They help their customers accelerate life sciences research, solve complex analytical challenges, improve patient diagnostics, and increase laboratory productivity. Their four premier brands, Thermo Scientific, Life Technologies, Fisher Scientific, and Unity Lab Services, offer an unmatched combination of innovative technologies, purchasing convenience, and comprehensive support. For more information, please visit www.thermofisher.com. Today's webinar reviews comprehensive anti-doping detection using the Q-Exactive Orbitrap Mass Spectrometer for Equine Urine Analysis. Dr. Scott D. Stanley, Professor of Equine Analytical Chemistry at the University of California, Davis School of Veterinary Medicine, is the featured presenter today. Dr. Stanley has focused his research efforts in the fields of equine pharmacology and analytical chemistry. He has published more than 100 research papers on drug testing pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, and veterinary pharmaceuticals. His research interests include the application of mass spectrometry for the detection of biomarkers for drug detection. We have a few important announcements before we begin. This webcast is designed to be interactive, and we encourage you to ask questions during the event. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon in the lower right-hand corner of the slide window. If you have any technical problems viewing or hearing the presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of your presentation window or submit your problem through the green Q&A button lower left. I would now like to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Scott Stanley. Thank you, Judy. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity today to speak to everyone uh, regarding some of the work that we do in our laboratory on the detection of uh, drugs and abuse, abuse of drugs in horse racing on the use of the uh, Q-Exactive Orbitrap Mass Spectrometer. Um, first, before I, I get into the details of the equipment, uh, I'd like to uh, share with you some of the information about the racing industry integrity, why drug testing is so important to establish integrity of the uh, performance events. Uh, a lot of that centers around some of the higher profile events, which get a lot of press in the media, Triple Crown events like the Kentucky Derby, the Breeders' Cup events, which are in California in October and November of this year, uh, those events accumulate uh, purse money of over $25 million. Also, with any positive findings we report, the trainer's livelihood is in a position to be uh, disreputed, so disqualification of the horse, certainly a suspension and a fine of their license are potential. So we want to be very careful in all of our analytical approaches, and then certainly laboratory reputation is paramount to the University of California. Today's presentation, I have a, just a brief outline, a slight introduction on some of the approaches that we take, the urine analysis and screening targets that we have, liquid chromatography, high-resolution mass spectrometry, method development application, including some information about quantitative determinations that we make using these approaches, I'll discuss some of the specific results with some of the basic and acidic drugs that we look for, certain classes of drugs, uh, and then talk more about the quantitative analysis capability that we found with the QXactive. And then a brief summary and, and questions. The key for our drug testing program uh, is what are we looking for? Uh, what target drugs? Um, how are we going to apply certain technologies to find those drugs? Where are we going to look for those? What biological matrices can we use? Blood, urine, uh, hair samples, other matrices that we can test for drugs of abuse. How are we going to find them? And then finally, you know, what does that analytical finding mean? Is there significance in uh, picogram levels of determinant therapeutic thresholds? 
So to first start off, uh, currently most of the laboratories throughout the world use a urine sample. Uh, the reason that we use urine sample for screening is uh, that it is the place where all mammals use to eliminate or, or uh, excrete drugs from their system. They concentrate drugs in the urine sample. Uh, higher concentrations are found then in the blood sample or typically saliva and other matrices. So it makes for the source of the highest concentration. On a horse, it's relatively easy to, main, to obtain. Uh, we're able to get much larger volume samples uh, than most biological species because of the volume of, of output. Uh, there's some limitations, however. The concentration of the drug in the urine sample does not correlate well with effect. What that means is that we can't establish from the concentration in the urine what effect that concentration may or may not have had on the horse at the time that they compete. In order to do most of these analysis over the years, we've ventured into a lot of different analytical approaches. Things like the ELISA test, the enzyme-linked aminoazorbin assay have been used for target testing. Um, they have the risk of a false positive, meaning the sensitivity of the kit is inadequate or cross-reactivity is not complete, so they're not all-encompassing. We've used gas chromatography mass spectrometry uh, with full scan mode uh, at very, very broad number of compounds that we can look for, virtually adding anything to our libraries. But it lacks sensitivity and, and specificity in some analytes. So a smaller group of analytes can be adequate, adequately detected. Uh, the gas chromatography MSMS has added sensitivity but typically at the cost of having a limited number of target compounds available. Our laboratory uh, at UC Davis was the first to employ LCMS screening for routine detection of compounds, uh, and we've done that in full scan mode, but again, in some cases because of laws of signal to detection and scanning capabilities and being able to collect enough significant data, in some cases we, last, we lack the sensitivity that we need to add in broad spectrum screening techniques. With the LCMS triple quads, we found plenty of sensitivity, but again, a limited scanning number. So our target compounds are so vast and so great, when numbering in the thousands, that we needed an alternative screening technology in order to fully encompass our anti-doping control program. So we are looking for a technique that would be very fast, very sensitive, have a stability of uh, being able to run thousands of samples, certainly hundreds before maintenance is done, having high degree of accuracy in a very large dynamic range with the compounds now that we detect being uh, often, uh, or not often, but occasionally peptides as well as small molecules. And then also because of the throughput capability and requirement for fast turnaround time, we want something that has minimal sam sample preparation. So in order to do that, we've investigated high-resolution, accurate mass techniques, which have been used in human Olympic athletes and other athletic competition in the last few years. These methods have been reported for the detection of, of human drugs as well as equine drugs, uh, and they represent a complementary testing program that we could also employ with blood samples which in the long run may be a better means for us to detect and screen these drugs because it's easier to obtain uh, and a cleaner matrix to deal with. <clears throat> but first, I want to talk uh, specifically about the method that we've developed using the QExactive MS instrument. Uh, now, the QExactive is a benchtop Orbitrap mass spectrometer. The original Orbitrap was a floor model. This new benchtop model has the comparable capability with a very high resolution of 140,000 uh, with a, at, at, sorry, at an OMO Z of 200. It has high mass accuracy capability. Uh, we have and obtain routinely uh, five PPMs with uh, external reference calibration on most of the compounds that we look for. We can get full scan data, still do polarity switching, and then have a feature called lock mass, which allows us to uh, do a, a number of different features as well as having the capability of doing some uh, experiments on the front end. And in addition to that, the instrument cost is very comparable to other triple quad or uh, high-end mass accurate instruments in their field. I wanted to, f before going into some of the details of the method, uh, show you a partial list of the complex compounds that we look for. 
and I selected just some anabolic steroids, some uh, beta and alpha agonist compounds, and then some analgesic compounds. And these do represent substantially different variation of, of analytes that we have to look for, uh, some of them getting routinely metabolized by the horse into other compounds, which make them more difficult to detect uh, at lower levels when they're excreted. But we needed a method that was capable and agile enough to collect all these drugs, plus this list as well. So our target list started at 600 compounds uh, for one analytical method, combining an acid neutral and base fractions from extraction and com combining those into a single injection in a short analytical run. For that, we, uh, we did select uh, the Xactive, Q-Xactive instrument uh, for the analysis, and we developed it and applied this method to do routine screening. And that includes a, a series of validation that we went through to demonstrate the fitness of the instrument for the capability. As I mentioned earlier, we use matrix, uh, which is urine. And that matrix is, in the case of a horse, quite dirty. Uh, horses are herbivores, so they consume a lot of grain products as well as a tremendous amount of forage on a daily basis. And most of that also gets excreted. The components or components of those get excreted in the horse's urine sample. In addition, horses uh, in their bladder develop a, a mucus that they excrete that protects their bladder. Uh, that also comes out in the urine, so we need, need to be able to deal with that as well in order to get our sample pr uh, prepared. We use a solid phase extraction approach uh, to eliminate most of the biological matrix that we're not interested in. We directly collect those, elute them into autosample vials. We use barcode system in order to track those, and all of that is uh, capable and, and very versatile with the QXACT of the software. It's very simple. Uh, SPE preparation, we add internal standards to all the horse urine samples so that we can make sure that the extraction and the analysis work properly. Uh, we use a simple pH buffering process. We also do uh, an enzyme hydrolysis procedure. Horses are very adept at glucuronide conjugation and sulfate conjugates. We use a variety of solvents to prepare those samples for the mixed mode column. We have a two-step sample elution process that gives us the acid neutral compounds and the base fraction. We evaporate all of those compounds down and reconstitute them in approximately 160 milliliters. So it's a very small sample size that we have. We start with only one mil of urine sample and proceed through this process. So we don't need a lot of material because we have a lot of sensitivity. In this particular example here, uh, this is the acid neutral base combination. Uh, this particular uh, run here in this chromatography segment targets about 150 different analytical compounds. What we were trying to establish here is just a short chromatography run of about 12 minutes so that we can quickly elute all of the compounds uh, with, this, uh, with the analytical collection time of about uh, 12 minutes to get all the compounds, and then a, a reconstitution out to 15 minutes. So we have a cycle time of approximately 15 minutes per analyte that we can, sorry, per sample that we can see all of these analytes. I'm going to target list on this particular base, uh, sorry, acid neutral component fraction is 150 compounds. And you can see on the instrument setup, we also have a variety of different features that we can control with the heated electric spray in the positive mode function. And we found that these parameters that are shown here are the ones that we could use for all of those compounds. So it's fairly universal uh, technique for the basic compounds that we can see all of these in positive mode. We do see some challenges when we're looking for compounds that produce a negative ion, uh, but because of the polarity switching, we can set those segments up to do polarity switching at the appropriate time in order to see our target analytes with a better sensitivity. So on the few compounds that show up in the negative mode, we can switch the polarity of the instrument and detect those compounds very readily. The acquisition, uh, and this may be the single, uh, one of the, the most exciting features about using a Q-exactive mass spectrometer, um, it's very easy to set up analytical methods. Because it's a full scan instrument, um, we used to set up a bunch of segments and uh, scan events when we were using a linear uh, ion trap mass spectrometer. But now, because of the capability, 
uh, we are able to set up one segment, one scan event, and then identify a variety of different filters. So you can see it's a very easy analytical setup. We can use the lock mass featuring of that to identify the masses that we're looking for uh, on compounds. We can also utilize, uh, you can see a variety of different features in the, anal in the instrument setup window in order to determine whether we're going to do full scan or partial scan, what compounds we're going to look for, what time periods we're going to look for those compounds and set up the instrument to be very productive. And this takes a very short period of time. Uh, and does not need to be modified if you add new analytes to your compound library list, which is a very nice feature as well. So, um, so the instrument methodology that we have for the data acquisition is a full scan. We use a range of 130 to 505 in a mass range with a resolution of 70,000. The resolution can be varied. Uh, we can run the resolution up to 140,000. We can run it at lower levels as well. We optimized our method at 70,000, and I'll show you in a little bit exactly why we feel that that's the, the best way to go. But again, doing a full scan and setting it up at a resolution of 70,000 is a very quick analytical method setup. It doesn't take a lot of complexity uh, to do that, and most anyone with a little analytical experience can set up a procedure like this. So. What we're looking for in these compounds that we're talking about is a very small injection volume. We use 40 microliters of the 160 microliter reconstituted volume and inject it into the detector uh, in a fairly slow analytical flow rate. It's pretty simple uh, to use auto sample or methodology here, as you can see, to set that up. And what we determined from that is that we have an external calibration curve that features a number of analytes that we target. We generally apply uh, FDA or GLP rules for calibration curve acceptance. Uh, in this case, we call it a semi-quantitative screening method because there's so many compounds in the procedure, we don't have analytical curves for all of them. In some cases, we did find with the QExactive that all, not, not all compounds were linear over the range. Uh, but mostly that was due to the fact that we were looking for extremely low concentrations and we had calibration samples at extremely high levels as, as well. So in some cases we saw saturation occurring at the top of the peak on our curves. So we had some cases where we weren't able to see uh, as high a linear range as other compounds. And I'll show a couple of examples of that. Most of that we were quickly enabled to accommodate if we had high concentrations by a simple dilution to make sure that the compound was in the linear range of our targets. Uh, the target analyte uh, list of setup uh, can be visualized here. This is a partial list of the compounds showing one of the analytes called albuterol that we look for. Albuterol is a bronchodilator. A bronchodilator is readily uh, detectable by this analytical method. The concern about a bronchodilator is that we may have a horse that was given an, uh, this compound before they compete, giving them an unfair competitive advantage. In addition to bronchodilation, these compounds can also be stimulatory, uh, increasing the heart rate. So we're concerned about this drug and this class of drugs as being uh, performance enhancing. But you can see very easily from the pick list, we can pick a compound, we can then uh, show the spectral capability uh, generated by the analytical method, as well as the chromatography on this particular compound. You can see a very distinct peak for that compound. And the very nice feature about a high mass accurate instrument is that you can see very little background. So the chromatography and the spectral quality of these instruments is very, very high and allows us to see low concentrations because the signal to noise ratio is favorable to the analyte. This is a second example that we have here. This is uh, stenazolol, which is an anabolic steroid. Stenazolol is a basic drug, so we see it in a base fraction. It has a molecular weight of 329, which is all we used to pursue with uh, non-accurate mass instruments. But with the high capability of accurate mass, uh, we can go out to four or five decimal points and take advantage of the specificity generated from a high mass accurate instrument. You can see the spectral quality of the 329.25 uh, 
uh, as being very characteristic of this compound. The retention time and chromatography, again, are very good with very, very little signal to noise, even from an extracted urine matrix, as in this sample. Our next uh, slide is just a library list of compounds. So the nice feature, another nice feature, is uh, being able to scan from library search from an Excel data spreadsheet. So we actually prepare our own library by putting compounds in there with the parent mass, the analyte target, and then the expected retention time of those compounds, and then also uh, other characteristics we need, intensity threshold, in order to step that through. Then the software quickly assesses that, and we can upload that information directly in and create our compound target list. So all we have to do is keep a running spreadsheet and make sure that the running spreadsheet is consistent with our analytical method in order to, to compare and do our library searching spectra as well. So it's a very convenient approach and method in order to do that. So now I'm going to show uh, some of the results of our analytical methods that we've done uh, using this instrument, showing some calibration information, limited quantitation on the instrument, uh, and the quantifying capability of the QExactive. Uh, mass spectrometer. And I'll start that with showing some of our LOD and LOQ data. Uh, just on a, a couple of examples that we have here, we've collected data on uh, most of the analytes that we look for now. In some cases, uh, you see as the first example, hyd hydrolazine. We have an LOD and an LOQ that are the same at one part per billion. But other compounds that you see highlighted like albuterol, clenbuterol, and salmeterol, which are all um, compounds that are considered to be bronchodilators, we have more sensitivity generally for those compounds with the capability of the uh, of clenbuterol being able to screen down to 30 parts per trillion in a urine sample and salmeterol at 50 parts per trillion. You can also see highlighted in red on this particular slide is one of our internal standards, uh, deuterated morphine. We use deuterated internal standards as a means to make sure that the analytical method is working properly. But we also monitor those concentrations to make sure that they aren't a potential drug of abuse as well. So the data that I have uh, from the analytical methodology is uh, starting with just some limited detection data. So this you see here uh, is the analyte albuterol again. With a calibration curve on the side, this is one of the analytes where we have a limited range of calibration. And one of the reasons is because the instrument gets saturated on the high end, but still has low end capabilities, which is really what we wanted on this, the capability to see down to 200 parts per trillion. We still have a very nice definitive peak for the chromatography, even though we're looking for a large number of compounds. We have other drugs. Uh, that we're concerned about. Gabapentin is a drug that's become very popular in human use, uh, less popular so far in veterinary medicine, but becoming more and more popular all the time. We also have uh, butorphanol, which is a, uh, a, an opiate drug that's approved for use in veterinary species. It's a very potent drug, so we have a, an analytical method here with good linearity in a range to 50 parts per trillion. We, in addition to that, have uh, hydromorphone, another opiate, uh, with good analytical capability at 250 parts per trillion. Zolpidem is a sleep aid, very commonly used, uh, known as Ambien. And this is a compound that I wanted to show because we have the capability of seeing the primary metabolite in the urine for the horse. The primary metabolite is a hydroxylated or carboxy. A zolpidem compound that we can see at low parts per trillion, approximately 500 parts per trillion, and quickly isolate the chromatography and the calibration range, as you can see from this example. In addition to that, we have the capability to see very low concentrations, in, even in biological matrix. This is a, an example of the calibration sample for a spiked 30 parts per trillion into a urine sample, and you can see that we can easily see that 30 parts per trillion with very little background for the drug clenbuterol. Uh, in blood samples, we've tested this instrument. We can see down to two parts per trillion in a quantitative sample. Uh, and that's, an example, that's the example I have here. Uh, we didn't, I don't have the slide showing the two parts per trillion. Uh, we've just uh, done that work more recently, but you can see with the percent differences 
the target range of the nine calibration points on this from 50 parts per trillion up to 2,000, we see very accurate and consistent data being generated through that entire range of, of compounds, which is quite remarkable for this technology that combines accurate mass as part of its detection capability. So for that, I wanted to show a little bit more information about the clenbuterol analyte that we look for and why we, uh, we are able to generate this. This is a different method than our full screening method. We're no longer looking for the 600 compounds, which is why you see a much more isolated and fast chromatography method. Still full scan, still looking for clenbuterol with a deuterated internal uh, um, marker, the deuterated clenbuterol. It's in positive mode, it, again, at 70,000 uh, resolution. We have uh, targeted scan speed, isolation widths that we set targeted specifically for clenbuterol. We also do a very quick divert of about a minute and a half in order to get uh, the waste out of the way from our chromatography. We have a simple two target analytes here with the precursor at 277 for clenbuterol and the qualifying and quantifying ions listed as 203 and 259. We use the 203 also as part of our screening method. Very distinct peak that we generate for that, very uh, reproducible. The deuterated internal standard you can see has different masses at each one of those, so it's the perfect internal standard for accurate quantitation uh, using this technique and this approach. You can see here the spectra generated from that is quite uh, specific and unique. Very clean data. Uh, the clenbuterol and the deuterated internal standard have those ions that we discussed as qualifying and quantification for qualifying and quantification purposes. Because the Q-Exactive has a quadrupole, we can do uh, a, an experiment on the front end, which allows us to get MS2 spectra. And you can see that in this case, is, in these cases, are MS2 spectra for the drug clenbuterol while still doing full scan analysis. So it's a very capable instrument that allows us to do a lot of unique things that we can't do or hadn't been able to do on instruments in, uh, prior to this. In addition to that, our laboratory has criteria uh, for our peak detection and peak determinations. Uh, so I wanted to show some of this, the peaks that we have identified in those are, are stacked as some of them are the clenbuterol, some of them are the deuterated to clenbuterol, but the top analyte is the clenbuterol, and you can see very easily at the resolution power of 70,000, we're able to get 10 scans across the peak. And that's a very important function that we have at our low levels, is still being able to get enough scans in order to have a legally defensible finding. So this is compound clenbuterol with enough scans at 70,000 resolution. Now we can increase the resolution and get more scans across the peak, but sometimes we sacrifice sensitivity in doing that. Um, and then uh, the broad range of capability of multiple analyte detection is also limited when you do a, a higher resolution. So we are targeting more scans, but we don't have quite the capability that we have if we use these middle range. And you can see the data here at 70,000, even at 50 picograms or parts per trillion, is more than adequate for us to identify the internal, the internal analyte of clenbuterol and its internal standard. The, uh, the clenbuterol, again, in these samples, uh, the calibration curve that you see here is uh, very adequately provided. I wanted to show this slide using the Thermo Fisher software for this instrument. You can also generate the precision and accuracy data. So in addition to reviewing your chromatography and seeing the calibration curve is listed, you can look at precision and accuracy differences within the software to demonstrate the quality of the quantitative capability of the instrument. And you can see by the parameters here, ranging in a very narrow range of about three to five, negative three to, to five, that they're very accurate in their determination of concentrations from the calibration curve used. Okay, so the next slide, we have the precision data. So in addition to the accuracy, we want to make sure it's precise. Um, this is an example that many people have used before. You can be very, very accurate but not precise. You can be very, very precise and not accurate. So you measure both parameters in order to determine the capability of the analytical method and the tool that you're using. And you can see here the RSDs and the percentage here targeting the internal standard 
uh, the RSD value is 2.56, which is an excellent percent RSDs. So both of these examples of accurate uh, determination and precision are comparable to that of a triple quadrupole mass spectrometer. Uh, so that's very favorable in the use of this for quantitative determinations as well as for the qualitative multiple analyte screening. Just to provide a little additional information on this analytical approach, uh, this is a slide that shows some of the data on the precision and accuracy ranges for those compounds over the, the length of the QC. The QC that we normally do as part of our uh, method acceptance is three or four different QC concentrations. Uh, one at no more than three times the limit of quantitation, and usually a middle and a high QC sample as well. And you can see the ranges on those are still quite nice at uh, negative three to uh, to 10.2 as our range. With a precision range in the batch of samples, we do inter and interday comparisons, and you can see that example there is 1.36 for the RSDs of clenbuterol. In addition to clenbuterol, uh, we were interested in corticosteroids because of the potential concern about use of corticosteroids in horses during competition. Uh, so we developed analytical plasma methods uh, for these compounds to make sure there were not therapeutic concentrations in the horse's system at the time that they compete. So this is actually showing the capability, again, of the Q-exactive, but now with a plasma sample instead of a urine sample. Very large linear range and accurate mass data is represented here um, with these two examples. Again, the analytical method of approach is using a deuterated internal standard. Uh, the deuterated internal standard allows us to uh, accurately determine the concentration within the biological and then we have the method parameters again at 70,000 resolution and positive method mode. The capability of identifying this compound, uh, we I use this example as a slightly higher molecular weight, more with a steroid type of compounds. Uh, often in the past, it had been done by GCMS uh, for anabolic and corticosteroids, but this LCMS method uh, does incredibly well with both of those classes of drugs, being able to see these compounds as well as analogs and metabolites at very, very low concentrations, even at these slightly higher molecular masses of, of uh, 235. We've also evaluated the instrument for higher molecular weight compounds, uh, small peptides and proteins that we look for, like dermorphin and other compounds that are about 800 molecular weight, and it does very well on those accurate masses as well. The characteristics uh, that still, uh, as an example I showed you earlier with clenbuterol, uh, the triamcinolone compound here works very well and provides a very nice spectrum for both the internal standard and the spectral uh, compound of target, the triamcinolone, very consistent and reproducible ions. One of the things that we have to do in order to have legally defensible data is have consistent ion ratio production and meet those criteria as established by uh, the industry in order to have defensible data, and we are always able to regenerate consistent ion ratios with these compounds, provided that we set up the analytical method and validate it first. So unlike older instruments that had issues with ion ratios, this instrument is very consistent with its ion ratios as well as its accurate mass determinations. Again, uh, another perfect example of the instrument being able to get 8 to 11 scans for peak at the resolution power that we need while still meeting the criteria of uh, 5 ppm for these analytes. This is an example here looking at the lowest calibration point of 25 picograms per mil of the triamcinolone in our analyte here. Beautiful peak shape, excellent uh, resolution over those, and being able to have uh, legally defensible data again for us to move forward. The accuracy and precision uh, for this compound is, is just as good as we showed previously with clenbuterol. Um, slightly different variation ranges. Uh, we have 12 calibration points on this particular example in plasma. One of the calibration ranges up as high as 13%, uh, but at the limits uh, still very, very excellent, reproducible, 4% uh, variation in, in the accuracy and precision, again, very consistent with, with this variety of different compounds. So in this one, we were actually able to get a larger linear range um, of 25 parts per trillion up to 5,000 parts per trillion. This is in a blood sample. 
uh, very reproducible information that we were able to provide with the ultra high resolution mass spectrometry. Be able to do that at a runtime of about three minutes, which is phenomenally fast to get this level of accurate data in order to uh, present that to our client and also, if necessary, to a hearing officer in, in court. The, uh, the other things that I wanted to talk about with this instrument are its capability and versatility to work into proteins and peptides. Uh, we don't have a lot of extra time today to talk about the proteins and peptides, but the capability of this crosses into that. And actually, most of the folks that use it uh, for analytical purposes are using it for the larger macromolecules instead of the small molecules. We're one of the people that use it for small molecules and sort of small molecule quantitation, but potentially its real forte is in the area of protein chemistry. So to sum up that information, uh, I wanted to conclude with a little bit of detail back to revisit that analytical approach. The q -Xactive that we use here had incredibly good sensitivity. Uh, we met or exceeded the sensitivity that we require out of our triple quad instruments on many analytes. We did find that there was some analyte specificity, meaning that some analytes did a little bit better on one instrument than the other. But almost across the board, we found that the exactive was as sensitive or more sensitive than the triple quads that we have used. We have virtually an unlimited number of molecules that we can look for. By adding in uh, to our data the specific masses that we're targeting and looking for that and screening for that on library compounds, we can just continue to add compounds without sacrificing our methodology because the method is stagnant in being one scan event over a range of compounds. The only thing that would change that is if we moved our molecular weight up to a much higher concentra uh, much higher mass, then we would have some limitations. But overall, we have almost no limitations. And the benefit of that is we can have compounds and, that have an unknown molecular mass that we can identify in this because it's a full scan instrument. We can even go back and reinterrogate data uh, from older samples that have not been uh, that we did not identify a compound in and reevaluate this if we identify a new compound. We've had that on a couple of occasions where a client has contacted us and said, is it possible for us to look in older samples for this? We can pull samples out of the freezer, but more easily, we can do a retrospective determination of testing by just going back and filtering through that data, looking for compounds. So our 600 target compounds that we have right now potentially comes way more than that just by allowing us to reinterrogate those with a new filter or a new compound list. So it, it, it potentially has the ability to store data for a long time. Uh, for human and equine athletes that may present an, a brand new opportunity and regulatory control for events that happened days, weeks, months, or even years ago. In this particular example, we were analyzing and targeted 600 compounds. Since we presented and developed this over the last couple of years, we've increased that compound list uh, substantially. Uh, so we hope to uh, double to triple this compound list in the future uh, to be able to expand to the new molecules and then also have a comparable one that looks for uh, protein compounds in the same approach. Many compounds looking at a high molecular weight range in order to identify those with a similar and appropriate extraction approach. Uh, I must acknowledge all the people that, that worked on this, and there's many more than I've even listed here, but Dr. Heather Kinich, uh, Dan McKimmy, and Emil Clifford have been the UC Davis people that have been principal in approaching and developing this methodology in the laboratory. And as always, I need to thank the, the people from uh, Thermo Fisher Scientific for their continued and, and um, uh, excellent support with the instruments that we get in order to approach the new capability of the technology. And with that, I will give it back to Judy and approach the questions. Thank you for that informative presentation. Before we get started on the question and answer session, I uh, would like to remind our anti-doping labs different from human anti-doping labs. Um, th there's, uh, there's not a tremendous amount of difference between the, uh, the human labs and the equine uh, or uh, animal doping laboratories. They, they, simil they use similar technology. 
uh, similar approaches. Um, we probably in the animal drug testing side test for more compounds because we don't have what's called a therapeutic ex exemption, uh, meaning that all of the compounds that, uh, that sometimes humans use for maintenance, um, they can get a, an exemption for. And those are very uh, uncommon to be used in uh, veterinary medicine for, and certainly not permitted for the horse to have during competitions. Great. Uh, how rugged has the Q-Exact been in your lab? Uh, very, very durable. The, uh, the instrument has uh, a substantial, uh, uh, it's almost always up and running. Uh, we've had an occasion where we've had some minor maintenance issues that come up, uh, but most of those can be handled by our own technicians, and the instrument is very reliable for what we've used over the last uh, several years, and we're very comfortable with, uh, with having the instrument as a routine workhorse in the lab. Great. Well, here's a great one. What are the biggest analytical challenges for equine drug testing labs? Um, probably the biggest challenges that we face now are similar to what human drug testing laboratories are facing with the emergence of uh, proteins and peptides as being a big challenge. So we're switching from small molecule analysis to macromolecules or proteins. And the real uh, fortunate thing is, is the, uh, the QXactive was virtually created, or the Orbitrap instruments were created for that purpose to do protein analysis. So we're fortunate in that we can do a very smooth and good transition uh, from small molecules to proteins with these compound, with these instrument, and it allows us a tremendous amount of capability to venture into a new field of protein chemistry. Great. Another one here. Does higher resolving power allow more scans or better sensitivity? Um, it, it, actually, uh, it actually reduces the number of scans that you tend to have per time and increases the sensitivity. So uh, you have to balance your analytical method when you're doing uh, validation and early developmental processes in order to maximize what you need, the number of scans per peak versus the sensitivity. So it's all part of um, an early development stage where you investigate or determine the best approach to use for the instrument uh, to optimize your method. We used the 70,000 resolution because we wanted to target um, you know, 9 to 10 scans across the peak as a basis for our forensically identifiable data. Uh, and that worked out very, very well for us. Uh, we could probably get more scans. Uh, we certainly could get more scans across the peak. Um, but we might sacrifice the sensitivity. So uh, just balancing that is, is ideal for us at 70,000. Great. Okay, we have uh, a commenter here, great list. Um, this person says, but what about MRPLs and PPD for some prohibited substances? For example, phenylbutazone, uh, admittedly there's a cheap single method for this. Yeah, um, we, um, our, our method limits are very basic based on the analyte. Um, in equine drug testing, the phenylbutazone concentrations that we see are probably quite a bit higher than they would get in residue testing for, say, um, uh, meat or for what they would do in the EU regarding the use of um, phenylbutazone in food animal. Uh, we don't have any problem with sensitivity on those. The method limits are, are usually quite adequate for all of our analytes. Um, it's just phenylbutazone is not one that we've tried to optimize. We can see that compound out to uh, about seven to ten days after administered, uh, and, I, and I know in cattle, for instance, it, it sticks around much longer than that. Uh, so it's analyte specific, but it's also species specific in how long you can see these compounds. We also routinely do uh, some uh, tissue samples, uh, and we found it to be very, very capable of dealing with that matrices as well, uh, ground up tissue samples that result in uh, residue of certain analytes that we've done for our residue avoidance clients. Great. Okay, here's another one. Big problem is live urine collection. Not all subjects are in race training, and so won't pee on demand. 
Um, well, it is a problem in some of the show events and, and events outside the racing industry where samples are trying to be obtained. Um, basically, horse will provide a urine sample if you're patient enough, uh, but we found that in um, probably 90% of the cases, a blood sample is more than adequate for us to get uh, drugs out of uh, as a detection method. It works very, very well because we can actually utilize that and obtain it much more uh, economically and efficiently rather than waiting for a urine sample. And it works well for, uh, for like I said, 90% of the drugs. Okay, another one here regarding calibration rules. They're asking if there's EU acceptance. Uh, yeah, well, it's, um, it's, those are fairly similar, uh, slightly different uh, criteria, I believe, in the EU than, than we use, but not substantially. Uh, our industry has a minimum criteria of identification using chromatography and mass spectrometry, uh, so that requires chromatogra chromatography specifications and ion ratio specifications for legally defensible data. Um, we typically use uh, three ions as a criteria minimum, even with MSMS. Um, our ion ratios, we target 10%, uh, and in MSMS, uh, we'll accept 20% in some cases for lower abundance ions. So those are fairly consistent with EU standards uh, as I know them. Uh, we also do uh, extensive method validation uh, per the USDA criteria for identification of compounds. Um, clenzurol and friends are also anabolic, hence mostly prohibited in fruit producing animals, uh, hence the need for quantitate MS at higher res. Um, a comment more than a question, but can you answer that? Or speak to yeah, that? Uh, clenbuterol works really well on this instrument. We have excellent sensitivity for those compounds. We can see them down in the low parts per trillion. Uh, generally, when these compounds are used in food animal species as anabolic agents, they're giving it, given at very high concentrations, uh, well within the capability of this instrument. And quantitatively, uh, we can quantitate down in the very low parts per trillion, and I mean two to five parts per trillion, uh, of clenbuterol on this instrument. So it's a very powerful tool for quantitation at a low level for that class of drugs. Okay, and someone is asking about ring tests, uh, for example, progetotriest? Um, ring tests, as I, as I understand them, we generally call them proficiency or round-robin testing, and that is something that's done in the industry, probably not as much as we'd like to, uh, but it's time and expense. So we do that generally on compounds where we're establishing a national or international threshold. Okay. Um, what is the scan rate of your experiments? Um, the scan rate on those particular experiments on, on the full method that I described today, uh, we do a scan rate for of it about uh, 200 milliseconds on MS and 100 milliseconds for MS, MS ions that we pursue. Okay, and did you perform uh, MS and MS2 at the same time, and what was the scan rate of these experiments? Uh, yeah, so I just kind of answered that. So the, okay. we do, on some of the compounds, do MSMS on the scan rate for that uh, when it's done for the, uh, for the compounds is uh, 100 millisecond. Sorry. Okay, and have all 600 compounds been analyzed simultaneously in a mix? Uh, no, we don't do that. Um, we, we tend to put uh, 25 to 50 compounds in a mix at the same time. Uh, fortunately, we don't ever see more than one or two compounds at a time. Uh, there may be occasion where we see three. Uh, because of the interferences that would occur of mixing 600 at the same time, I think it would compromise the analytical method and not at all represent what it would, it would really do in a real-world environment. So what we tend to do is stick with just uh, 25 to 50 compounds at a time. Okay. Um, how many SPE conditions for your urine screening, and what are the SPE sorbents used? Uh, the, we use a mixed mode column for that uh, with a C18 and ion exchange. Uh, it allows us to get multiple fractions and then split those fractions uh, into different components for the, for the acid neutral and base analyses that we perform. 
so it's fairly standard uh, 3cc cartridge column that we use, uh, but a mixed mode bed, usually a polymer column. Okay. And uh, what are the validation criteria used for screening? The valida validation criteria that we do is we establish, uh, you know, we have a SOP for method validation and encompasses, I believe, eight components. We use uh, ruggedness, sensitivity, precision, accuracy, uh, linearity, um, specificity, and sensitivity as determination. So we'll figure uh, or calculate method limited detection, limited quantitation. Uh, the validation criteria that we run, we typically run three um, QC concentrations, uh, the lowest bunt one being no more than 3x of the LOQ. And the, we run those in six replicates on uh, th two different days in order to meet our validation criteria. And all of those, uh, with the exception of the lowest concentration, have to be within 15% of the target value. Great. How is ion suppression handled or assessed in such a short run time? Um, we do worry about ion suppression. Uh, most of the ion suppression is due to matrices and not due to our analyte. Uh, so what we can do is, uh, is uh, dilute the sample uh, for if we have a particular difficult ion matrix because we have so much sensitivity. Uh, it allows us to do that. Okay. And how often do you calibrate the Q-exactive? Um, we actually um, do it on a weekly basis um, or on an as-needed. Uh, so typically on Monday we'll calibrate the instrument to make sure that it still meets uh, our criteria. Um, I, I do know under, understand that other people do that less frequently, um, but we find that it's just easier to come in on Monday and have that regularly scheduled. If we do any maintenance, uh, we automatically uh, calibrate after any maintenance. Okay, and what are the two elution steps and what volume are you eluding since you're going straight to the auto sampler vials? Um, we go directly in the auto sampler vials and um, we elute with um, um, compound, uh, sorry, we, we wash it out and then we elute with uh, different matrices, uh, methanol and um, I'd have to double check and see exactly. I can't remember exactly our elution solvents for those. I apologize. Um, so I'll try and get that posted somewhere so I, I'm actually correct instead of just trying to uh, remember. Okay. And uh, have you seen space charging with the instrument causing change in masses? Um, we have seen that phenomenon. It uh, is something that we control in our, in our, in our approach uh, on this, so it isn't something that we frequently see. Uh, but we have been able to experimentally demonstrate that. Uh, so I don't know if that actually counts or not because uh, we, we tried to make it happen and we were able to make it happen. Uh, but it isn't something that we see routinely. Okay. Unfortunately, we are out of time. I want to thank our audience for their interesting questions and participation in today's event. I would also like to thank our sponsors, Thermo Fisher Scientific, for making today's educational webcast possible. Today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing. You will receive an email from LabRoots alerting you when this webcast will be available for replay. We invite you to forward that announcement to your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. See you next time. Goodbye.